when you begin trying to define the very essence of Ireland and the Irish, you'll find that this is one of the most enigmatic countries and peoples of the world. With roots firmly planted in Celtic culture, there is a magical quality to both the landscape and the folklore that makes the skill of the storyteller a recognised art form. From the mighty Finn McCool, the giant responsible for building the Great Causeway, to the rippling waters of Tierna Nog, the land of eternal youth, you'll find yourself enraptured by all that you discover, particularly if you stumble into a little Irish bar and enjoy the convivial welcome to be found there. After all, nothing can be more enlightening or alluring than a glass of mellow Irish whiskey to help you appreciate what a fine land this really is. And here lies another great tale of Ireland, immortalised in the golden liquid swirling around in your glass, that has defied the passage of time to become one of the nation's most precious assets. It's a story that can be as dramatic and as dangerous as the legend of Finn McCall. While in other respects, it's as romantic as the mystical tale of Tierna Nog itself. Irish whisky will always have a knack for spinning its magic. And whether this is your first encounter with the heavenly brew, or you're a well-seasoned connoisseur, your appreciation of whisky will be increased from a greater understanding of how it came to be. On the Irish whisky trail, we'll take you from one end of Ireland to the other in search of the finest examples of the whisky distiller's craft. With Jameson, Bushmills, Middleton, Powers and Paddy. To mention just a few of the top brands we'll be looking at, this program will undoubtedly broaden your horizons and inevitably your appreciation of this exceptional drink that for many people is truly the spirit of Ireland. Precise origins of whisky remain unclear to this day, but Ireland without doubt has the strongest claim to being its birthplace. From as early as the 6th century, Irish monks travelled far and wide, and it's believed they learned the rudiments of distillation after observing Arab alchemists isolating perfume essences in alembics, which certainly share more than a passing resemblance to the copper pot stills that even now are an intrinsic part of the modern whisky making process. What's more, these wandering clerics evidently didn't keep the technique to themselves, because it's thought that while spreading the word of God to their Scottish neighbours, they also preached the more readily accepted gospel according to the whisky maker. The shared heritage of the two nations, with their variations upon the Gaelic language, describe the newly discovered spirit as the water of life, Ishkaba. Over the years since, the anglicised version turned Ishka into whiskey for all time. However, the two cultures do spell the word differently with the Irish including an E, whereas the Scots always drop the additional vowel. Mm -hmm. 
There are those who have suggested that the unrelenting rain that Ireland is famous for has contributed to the nation's whiskey making prowess for two reasons. Firstly, folk who spent a fair proportion of their time soaked to the skin and battered by cold Atlantic gales certainly had the motivation to concoct a wee drop of something warming to keep out the chill. And secondly, perhaps even more importantly, the climate as a result of this higher than average rainfall is perfect for growing barley, one of the staple ingredients of whiskey. A soft, pure water supply is also crucial, and naturally, there's never been any shortage in this respect either. But don't get the idea that Ireland is always wet and cold. Only the raw winter months can be a bit bleak. The summers are often as not warm and sunny, showing off the Emerald Isle to its best advantage. Consequently, whiskey making flourished all over Ireland with thousands of stills bubbling and steaming wherever barley and water were readily available, providing the Irish with a regular supply of their favourite tipple. Come down from Purple Mountain, come ye to the glen, across the loch and burren, come the Irishmen, beneath their dancing banners, as to the call they hail, the sound of fife, the sound of skin, come the children of the gale. take a look at Irish history, it will become immediately obvious that relations with neighbouring Great Britain have never been exactly straightforward. Although the Irish whisky maker's art has often been much appreciated. Queen Elizabeth I was rather partial to the intoxicating brew, and on one occasion even rewarded her great favourite, Sir Walter Raleigh, with the gift of a 32 gallon keg of golden Irish whisky which by all accounts was enjoyed by the opportunist adventurer very much indeed. Unfortunately, however, those that were to follow in the feisty royal lady's powerful footsteps did not treat Irish whiskey, or anything Irish for that matter, with anything like the respect it deserved. On Elizabeth's demise, England and Scotland became unified. But within a matter of years, Britain was embroiled in a bloody civil war. Oliver Cromwell and his parliamentarians turned against the crown and usurped the monarchy. Singularly unattractive, Cromwell was not a romantic figure, with his puritanical views and zealous approach to religion. And for the Irish, he is still one of the most hated English characters from history to this day. There were many royalist supporters in Ireland who were massacred by Cromwell in most brutal fashion, with the siege of Drogheda being a prime example of the atrocities committed. But what you may well wonder, has this got to do with Irish whiskey? After all, Cromwell was hardly subjugating the Irish to take their whiskey away and drink it to himself. However, the consequences of the conflict gave Ireland even more reason to dislike Cromwell. When the Civil War came to an end and Charles II was restored to the British throne in 1660, the treasury coffers were at an all-time low. Taxation looked extremely promising and all manner of commodities were quickly targeted by the accountancy boffins in London, 
with whisky proving to be an excise man's gold mine in both Ireland and Scotland. At a charge of four pence a gallon, the levy was an abomination to all native Irishmen, and many of their number fled to the hill to avoid the taxman's avaricious gaze. It truly was adding insult to injury, and resentment towards London's unwelcome intervention in Irish affairs was not for the first time strongly voiced, with the Scottish whisky makers suffering the same strictures as well. At least, the Irish had water between themselves and the British mainland, which was a considerable advantage to the illicit distillers. But when an excise office was opened in Dublin, the long arm of the law no longer needed quite such an extensive reach. Matters were not helped by the cumbersome nature of the new laws that in certain respects were quite unworkable. In general terms, small stills were discouraged and the larger producers had the potential to take over the market. But the battle lines were drawn. The job of the excise man was a dangerous one, particularly away from the city, where entire rural communities were quite literally prepared to fight to the death for the whisky cores. Irish whisky making remained in this state of confusion for some considerable years. I will now step forward in time to the late 1700s, when a canny Scot by the name of John Jameson arrived in Dublin and set up in business, producing whisky at this Bow Street distillery. His pedigree was certainly exemplary, as he was linked with other famous whisky makers, and even his wife Margaret's family, the Hagues, were also established in the industry and they are still producing one of the world's best-loved Scotch blends to this day. Fortunately for the whisky enthusiast, it's possible to follow the great man's footsteps because his Bow Street site has been transformed into the old Jameson Distillery. A wonderful audio-visual experience charting the history and manufacture of the Jameson brand, from humble beginnings to its present day market position as the most successful Irish whisky of them all. It certainly adds an ironic twist to the story when you consider the fact that a Scotsman did so much to advance the cause of Irish whisky. When it was the Irish who had taught the Scots the art of distillation in the first place, But advance the cause is precisely what John Jameson did. And you'll certainly discover just exactly how, as you explore this beautifully presented exhibition. This is also a very good point at which to investigate the process of Irish whisky making and search out the differences between it and its often better known Scottish relation. you come from. If you want to make whiskey you need the grain, preferably barley, and how you treat it will depend very much upon your location. Chemically speaking, to produce the enzyme required to convert barley into starch and soluble sugars, germination must take place. This is achieved by soaking the barley in water and then spreading it over a stone malting floor, turning it regularly. The process then needs halting after about 12 days and this is achieved by drying the green malt, as it's called, in a kiln. Now here's one of the most fundamental differences between Irish whisky and Scotch. 
Despite the prolific availability of peat in Ireland, the barley is dried in a closed kiln rather than over a peat fire. In Scotland, where you'll see pagoda-shaped kilns at all the major distilleries, peat furnaces are used to dry the malt, imparting a classically smoky flavour to the whisky. As an interesting side note, the Irish often use both malted and unmalted barley in their mix. This is because a 19th century tax on malt sent the Irish whisky makers searching for ways to avoid the dreaded excise man once again. Although born of necessity, the technique became an intrinsic part of the Irish process and to this day is still used to give the finished whisky a very specific quality. The next step is mashing, where the barley, malted or otherwise, is ground to become grist, and then mixed with water in the mash tun to produce wort, a frothy, brownish liquid. The Irish have their own word for a mash tun, referring to it as a keeve, but the outcome is exactly the same. The wort is then fermented in washbacks with yeast converting the bubbling brew sugar into alcohol. Throughout these two stages, the Scottish process has no variation from the Irish. But although this still house in Glenfiddich in Scotland looks very similar to the reconstruction you'll see at the old Jameson distillery, what actually happens is very different, as of course are the finished products. Basically, alcohol has a lower boiling point than water, so it steams off and condenses. Here at Jameson, you see three copper pot stills, the wash, the faint and the spirit, because the whisky is distilled three times. In Scotland, only two distillations are used, which leaves a little more fire in the finished spirit, as noted by Dr. Johnson in his first innovative dictionary in 1755. The definition of whisky, or Ishkabar as it was described, is as follows. The Irish sort is particularly distinguished for its pleasant and mild flavour. In Scotland, it is somewhat hotter. Historically, this difference made the Irish whisky far more suited to the undeveloped palate of the international export market whereas the Scotch version tended to be most appreciated at home. This certainly worked to John Jameson's advantage, combined with more standardised taxation laws, and by the time of his death at the ripe old age of 83, in 1823, his eldest son was in a position to steer the prospering whisky dynasty into a golden age. Casks full of Jameson were safely stored in cellars below the Bow Street premises, and the company's rosy future looked well and truly assured. However, the events of the next decade were to completely reverse this position, as Scotland not only caught up in the lucrative race for the whisky export market, it eventually overtook Ireland in what was a remarkable set of circumstances. When retired Irish excise man Aeneas Coffey came to the major whisky companies of his native land with the suggestion of a new type of still, he was given short shrift. There was undoubtedly a degree of distrust about a man perceived to be from the enemy camp. And they certainly believed that he was threatening their traditional methods, which is why his progressive idea was rejected out of hand. The coffee, or patent still, that he had invented could distill in excess of 200 gallons of spirit in an hour. An astonishing achievement for the time, particularly as a variety of grain, depending upon what was available, could be used, producing a mild, light finished whisky. Undeterred, Kofi set off for the British mainland 
and the predominantly malt scotch whiskey distillers of the north took up his invention with enthusiasm. They could take the light grain whiskey that Kofi still produced and mix it with their fiery malts to cool and mellow a blended brew. Jameson relations by marriage, the Hagues, flourished with new blends and Johnny Walker, an entrepreneurial grocer from Kilmarnock, laid down the foundations for a whole new whiskey dynasty of his own. His red, black and blue label whiskies were some of the best loved brands in the world, past, present and future. If turning away the Kofi still was short-sighted on the part of the Irish distillers, costing them dearly, the developments of the 20th century presented even greater difficulties for the industry to overcome. Politically, the tension had been rising in Ireland for centuries as the fight for Irish independence from Britain escalated even more dramatically. The Easter Uprising of 1916 was a stark warning to London that matters needed to be addressed. But bitter feelings ran high on both sides, and when an Irish free state was finally created in 1922, the resulting bad blood saw the British close the door on Irish imports, including, of course, whiskey. Not only were sales to Britain lost, markets on the far-flung corners of the then extensive British Empire were also closed, leaving the Irish whiskey distillers just home consumption and exports to America to sustain them. But worse was still to come, as prohibition annihilated sales of Irish whiskey in the USA. It was a bizarre turn of fate, as in 1920, the American government prohibited the manufacture, transportation and sale of alcohol in any shape or form. For the 13 years that prohibition ran, far from achieving a more morally upstanding nation, the experiment had the opposite effect. Alcohol became a valuable commodity, and illegal drinking dens put it into the control of gangsters, pushing crime levels up to record levels. There were to be no imports of legitimate Irish whiskey, and the many thousands of Irish Americans descended from the poverty-stricken immigrants who had fled from their native island in times of hardship, most notably the potato famine of the 1850s, could no longer enjoy a taste of the old country. Further damage was done due to the fact that alcohol was produced in any backstreet brew house that could be prevailed upon and a great deal of this poor quality bootleg liquor was labelled Irish whisky. The fine reputation that such worthies as John Jameson and Sons had built up was smashed with bad publicity. Even when prohibition was abolished in 1933, the people of America were reluctant to touch any Irish whiskey, even when it was the genuine article. One problem had followed another for so long, compounding the impact of each difficulty. Pulling the Irish whiskey industry back into profit in the later half of the 20th century was going to be a tall order indeed. Then, in 1966, a crucial development set Irish whisky on the road to recovery. Jameson and Powers, the other major whisky manufacturer to have survived in Dublin, merged with the Cork Distilleries Company, which included such great local brands as Middleton and Paddy. The 
Irish Distillers Group was formed and steady progress was made as resources were pooled all across Ireland. To a greater extent, it was effectively the end of the smaller independent distilleries, but those that came under the IDG umbrella were at least assured a stable future. In 1972, Bushmills joined forces as well, continuing to distill at their County Antrim site, while all other whisky production moved to a brand new distillery at Middleton near Cork in 1974. But the age-old problem of restoring Irish whisky to its previous status on the export market was still proving difficult. By the 1980s, it was obvious that this issue needed resolving once and for all, if the IDG stood any chance of consolidating its successes to progressively move towards a secure future. So when the French-owned drinks group, Pernod Ricard, made a bid for the Irish Distillers Group, it was accepted to everyone's mutual advantage. With access to the French company's extensive export market, Irish whisky made one of the most dramatic commercial comebacks of all time, climaxing in 1995 as the annual world sales of Jameson topped the 10 million bottles mark. And things don't stop there. Jameson has gone from strength to strength, as have the other Irish whisky brands in the Irish Distillers Group. Well, that's quite enough history for the present time, because fascinating as it might be, particularly in the way it's presented at the old Jameson distillery, what we're really interested in in this programme is the whisky itself. Should you ever get to Dublin, the Bow Street tour is absolutely absorbing. But of course, the highlight has to be the happy conclusion in the old Jameson bar. Now, first and foremost, you have to try Jameson, the Irish whisky that is literally taking the world by storm. Clever advertising campaigns entice busy folk as far afield as Tokyo and Rome to stop a while and appreciate the relaxing qualities of a Jameson. What's the rush is the question posed in adverts everywhere. And of course, the answer is to be found in the warming spirit at the bottom of the glass. If you've never tasted whiskey before in your life, you don't need to be wary of this beautifully smooth drink. A whiskey with so much to recommend it. You'll find the mellow sweetness of Jameson is balanced by fresh floral notes. However, on the palate, the flavor is gently developed with mild degree of woodiness and a good sherry kick. It could be said that Jameson is the true spirit of Ireland, as it has led the way in the recovery of Irish whisky's fortunes, and you definitely get the feeling that even greater success awaits this brand of the moment. Don't be surprised when you see a whole shelf of different Jameson bottles, because there's quite a selection to choose from. The Jameson 1780, named after the year in which the great man founded his Bow Street distillery, is again smooth, and after aging for at least 12 years extensively in sherry wood, the flavour is greatly enhanced. There is also a Jameson 12-year-old brand, which is more full-flavoured again, and has been developed to appeal to the tastes of the Far Eastern market. The Jameson Gold is another deluxe whisky, and the old Jameson 12 year reserve is a rare treat indeed, with its lovely rich smooth flavour and dry finish. If you get the chance to try Redbreast Pure Pot Still Whiskey, you'll certainly not be disappointed by this treasured member of the Jameson stable. 
The sweetness is soft and sherried, but there's a definite depth to the long finish with the last hint of spice to complete the experience. Now, before we leave Dublin, you really must give Powers Whiskey a shot. A true native of the city. It could be said that while Jameson was always the Coca-Cola of the Dublin whiskies, Powers was the Pepsi. Equally as good, but just a hair's breadth behind. If you've never been to Ireland, you'll possibly not have encountered Powers whiskies. But for the home market, it's perhaps the most popular of all. Dating back to 1791, Power and Sons were renowned for their progressive attitudes, particularly when it came to supplying their customers. In 1886, Powers became the pioneers of Irish whiskey bottling, because up until this time, almost all drinks were sold straight from the barrel, a practice that was open to adulteration from unscrupulous merchants and publicans. With bottling on site, customers got exactly what Powers intended them to have. And what's more, they could carry it home without having to swallow it first. It was a trend that caught on very quickly with all the other distillers following suit. Powers also introduced the first miniature bottles, fondly nicknamed Baby Power, which contained, as the advertising men on the day claimed, a three swallow capacity. Again, it was an excellent idea, and other distillers soon put their own miniatures into production. And today there are few major whiskey distillers the world over who don't offer these handy sized tasters of their very special brands. But tales of the past successes of Powers aside, this really is a great whiskey, with all the classic smoothness of the three times distilled Irish process. There is a luscious peach quality, rich malty flavours and a pleasant dry finish. As well as the standard Powers whisky, there's also a 12 year old reserve that has even more richness and rounded flavour. And if you ask any Irishman, he's certain to recommend it. Having enjoyed the great whiskies of Dublin, it's time to move ever onwards and northwards in this occasion, beyond Belfast to the rugged dramatic coastline of County Antrim and the old Bushmills distillery, a mere stone throw from the Giant's Causeway. Searching for his lady Well, all the servant girls replied She's off with the gypsy Davy Now, rattle for the gypsy, gypsy Rattle for the gypsy Davy Rattle for the gypsy, gypsy Rattle for the gypsy Davy Well, settle for me the old grey mare For me big horse is not speedy Now settle for me the old grey mare Me brown horse is not speedy Rattle for the gypsy, gypsy, rattle for the gypsy, baby. So rattle for the gypsy, gypsy, rattle for the gypsy, baby. Oh, well, he rode high, he rode low, searching for this lady. Now he rode high and he rode low, overtook his fair lady. Rattle for the gypsy, gypsy, rattle for the gypsy, baby. Rattle for the gypsy, gypsy, rattle for the gypsy, baby. Why did you leave their home in the land and why did you leave their baby? Now why did you leave the home in the land to be off with the gypsy Davy? 
sore. Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Now I'm going to cut those snow white gloves on speed of Spanish leather. We're going to cut those snow white gloves and bid farewell forever. Now rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Last night I slept in the goose by the bed with the sheets and blankets over me. But tonight I'll sleep on the cold, cold earth and the arms of the gypsy, Davy. Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Well, why did you leave your home in your land and why did you leave your baby? Well, why did you leave your home and your land to be up with the gypsy, Davy? Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. Rattle with the gypsy, gypsy, rattle with the gypsy, Davy. <laughs> If you want to make the trip here to Bushmills for yourself, you'll have no trouble finding it. Just head for the Giant's Causeway and you'll see plenty of helpful signs to direct you. This is a programme about whisky, so obviously we're more interested in the distillery than amazing geological structure. But it's well worth taking a few moments to have a closer look, because it will help your understanding of the character of Bushmills whisky. Legend has it that the mighty Finn McCool, giant and all-round Irish mega-hero, fell for the charms of a Scottish giantess living across the sea on the island of Staffer. Naturally, as any hero worth his salt would in such circumstances, he started to build a causeway to reach her. Interestingly, you can find similar rock formations in Staffer because as the story goes, the worthy lady was a dab hand at building herself so she set to work to reach her true love halfway. What then ensued was an epic battle of rock hurling, when an amorous Scottish giant took a very dim view of Finn stealing the woman of his dreams from under his very nose. This put pay to any causeway linking Ireland and Scotland, and if you care to investigate further, sent Finn McCall off in search of more accessible female company. Now nobody's going to tell you that the mighty Finn McCall had anything to do with whiskey at Bushmills. Though no doubt after a glass or two you'd be happy to believe that a heroic giant was responsible for this rock formation rather than millions of years of geological activity. And all this is not quite as tenuous as you might think. On a fine clear day, you can make out the island of Islay in the distance of the Scottish mainland, just 16 miles away. Which immediately suggests that Finn McCall's idea wasn't such a crazy one after all. Any Scotch whisky enthusiast will tell you that there are very distinct whisky making regions in Scotland, and Islay is certainly one of them. 
characteristically peaty and smoky, the Islay single malts can be pretty complex. Lagavulin, for instance, has a kick like a mule, but is absolutely divine. And you'll never find a product less like the smooth, mellow Irish whiskey. But it's the fact that they are single malts that connects them with Bushmills, a fact that distinguishes this whiskey from the majority of Irish brands. Bushmills is perhaps best described as being the bridge between Irish and Scottish whisky. And when you discover just how close the two nations are at this point, geographically speaking at least, it would hardly come as any surprise that there are similarities between the near neighbours distillation processes. Of all the Irish whisky distilleries you'll visit in Ireland, Old Bushmills is without doubt one of the most picturesque, with more than a passing resemblance to the Speyside distilleries of Scotland. This is because the scene is dominated by the beautiful pagoda towers, where barley was dried, but unlike their Scottish counterparts, without peat in the furnace. Historically speaking, these towers were a relatively new addition to the Bushmills landscape, being of Victorian design due to the fact that a fire destroyed much of the distillery in 1855. The original buildings were considerably older. Bushmills has a claim to being the oldest distillery in the world, with the first grant to distill legally in this area being awarded in 1608. Official documentation is only available from the founding of the Bushmills company here in 1783 but this is nevertheless a remarkable testimony of endurance. And the fact that, unlike so many of its contemporaries, Bushmills is still distilling on this site, speaks volumes for the tenacity of generations of Irish whiskey men. At this point, you may be wondering why it's worth traveling so many miles from old Jameson in Dublin to visit another distillery that is part of the same distillers group. Because after all, surely you'll see the same things over again. There is no mystery to whiskey making, no great secret recipe. So why bother to embark on the whiskey trail? The Jameson Bar and Shop has ample supplies of all Bushmills whiskies, so you certainly won't miss out on tasting the various malts and blends. What you'd actually forego is the opportunity to walk around a living, breathing distillery with a first-class guide who will explain the whole process to you. There are no days set aside specifically for this purpose or specially constructed display areas. You will quite literally be taken around the plant in full production. An amazing experience where the sight, sound and smells of whiskey making at its very best will prove unforgettable. First stop is the Mash Tun, the Irish Keeve, where foaming wort is produced to the highest specifications. The aroma as you enter is heavy on the air, and as you take a closer look at the traditional machinery, just remember, this is how whiskey has been made for centuries. The next stage at Bushmills is rather high-tech, with stainless steel washbacks where the yeast is added and fermentation takes place. If you visit Glenfiddich in Scotland, you'll find a wonderful collection of old wooden washbacks, still very efficiently in production, a marked contrast to what you'll see here. However, as you enter the still room, you could be stepping back hundreds of years. Nothing has altered in the techniques used. And apart from computers to help monitor the proceedings, this is as close to the ancient whiskey maker's art as anyone could hope to get. The 
the hissing and spluttering of the steam in the system almost speaks to you. And the gleaming bulbous copper pot stills have, without doubt, veritable personalities of their own. Look out for the three different stages of distillation. With wash, faint and spirit stills busily in action, this is a truly wonderful place, warm and inviting. But there is something a little unnerving about the heavy breathing sounds that the pipes and the pot stills generate. And to be alone here at the dead of night would not be a wise thing for those of a nervous disposition. At this point in the whiskey making process, you've got alcohol with a high percentage proof. At least today there are safe methods for deciding the strength of the distillate. But in days, now fortunately, long since past, it was a very dangerous business indeed. Gunpowder was mixed with the spirit to form a potentially lethal cocktail. And if it exploded when you set it alight, should you have survived the experience, you would know that your whiskey was just a wee bit on the strong side. But what you have at the end of all these processes still can't even be called whiskey. And at Bushmills, you do get the chance to see firsthand the extensive and lengthy tasks that now need to be undertaken before the pure Irish spirit can proudly receive its name. You have already seen great skill in action, but there is a further group of remarkable craftsmen working traditionally within the Irish whiskey industry. Without the Cooper, the wonderful variation of flavours that we have been discussing in many of the whisky brands simply would not exist. The making of casks has changed little since Roman times, with the Roman word for barrel maker, coparius, being handed down to give our modern craftsman his name. The tools you can see him using could well have come from an archaeological dig, and are as fit for the purpose of the present as they ever were. Although perfectly able to create a barrel from scratch, most of the cooper's work here at Bushmills involves rebuilding and restoring casks that have previously been used for sherry or American bourbon. This is critical to the flavour of the Finnish whisky, and as we've already discussed at the Old Jameson distillery, sherry notes are much appreciated in specific brands. When you consider the fact that it takes a minimum of three years for maturation to legally provide you with whisky, in either Ireland or Scotland, the importance of the cask is paramount. Here you can actually see that the liquid going into the barrels is clear, and from this moment onwards it will not be exposed to the light of day again for at least three years. The oak wood casks will not only by then have imparted sufficient flavour to the whisky, they will also have turned the spirit its delightfully distinctive golden colour. For a company as large as Bushmills, maturing these precious barrels in waiting, that are a lifeblood of the business, needs space and perfectly controlled conditions. Take a look at how Scottish barrels are matured first, in wide, low warehouses, and another difference between Scotch and Irish whisky can be noted. When you walk into an Irish warehouse, 
the enormity of the maturation system will overwhelm you. A great deal of research has been done, and the outcome has been that standing barrels end up on pallets makes no difference whatsoever to the finished result. It just makes management of the casks a whole lot easier. But whether you walk into a Scotch warehouse or an Irish one, the smell in the cool, dark atmosphere is absolutely divine. What you will detect aromatically is the angel share, a romantic name for the spirit that evaporates as the good clean air permeates the fine oak casks. Depending upon how long the whiskey remains in barrels at this stage, about 7 to 10% of the spirit will disappear in this fashion. And painful as it might be for the producer, without this natural wastage, there would be no whiskey to enjoy at the end of the day. Once the whiskey has reached maturity, it's time for the blender to marry together the different vintages to produce the complete range of Bushmills brands. After careful manipulation, the finished whiskies are collected in vats, ready for bottling and for the many thousands of visitors who make the pilgrimage to the Bushmills bottling plant, is certainly an added and mesmerising bonus. However, as we reach the end of our guided tour, particularly if you've been to all Jameson at Dublin first, you'll know what's coming next. The aptly named 1608 bar awaits, with a wonderful selection of Bushmills finest for you to try. The best known of all the blends here has to be Black Bush an award-winning speciality with a sweet toffee nose. There's truly something for everyone, novice whiskey taster and connoisseur alike, as it's smooth and silky soft with a perfectly balanced maltiness and mellow sherry finish. When it comes to the Bushmill single malts, you really are in for a treat. The ten-year-old version is clean and crisp with hints of apple blossom, clover and bran. Another interesting variation on the theme is the 16-year-old three-wood single malt. Now don't be thinking that this has anything to do with golf clubs. Quite simply, the whiskey is matured in three different ways. Firstly, 50% bourbon wood is used. Secondly, 50% sherry and then it's finished in port pipes for the last year and a half. And you can detect notes of each in this well-balanced, full-bodied, smooth and sweet malt. A quick note here, for anyone who does find their way to Bushmills, make sure you try the Distillery Reserve. This is the only place you can find it, and you won't be disappointed. Honey rich with spicy fruity overtones, and a distinct peachiness. There is a powerful finish that lingers most satisfyingly. If you're very lucky, you might get your own personalised bottle. A pleasure to drink and then the perfect souvenir to remind you of a day very well spent. When we talk about tasting whiskey in this programme, it is very much geared towards drinking for pleasure and broadening the experience to develop the palate. But when the experts taste whiskey, it's a different matter altogether. Here we find Colm Egan, Bushmills head distiller, and Billy Layton, the warehouse manager, testing out a cask of the very best. So watch and learn. And now we get to the most exciting part of my day, where we get to sample the spirit after spending 21 years in this old cask. So Billy is going to remove the bung and take a sample off the spirit inside using the Valenche. So having removed the sample, we need to take a sniff, which Billy is going to help me do. Uh, 
And then we need to take a taste. Mm. Full bodied, mm -hmm. rounded, real Madeira notes. Yeah, you get the influence of the Madeira there with the, uh, the fruitiness, the sweetness, a bit of chocolate, the caramel there. Um, I think that's the one for us. Ah. Oh, 21 year old malt, exquisite product. Cheers. And on that most appropriate note, it's time to leave Old Bushmills and Northern Ireland to head south towards Cork and the distillery town of Middleton, the last of the Irish distillers group sites on our tour and the heart of their production in the Irish Republic. The soldiers lay close in their quarters They were thinking no doubt of the dear ones at home Of their mothers, wives, sisters and daughters And with a pipe in his mouth sat a dashing young blade And the song he was singing so gaily It was honest Pat Murphy of Ma's brigade And he sang of the sprig of shillelagh Says Pat to his mother, it looks strange to me, brothers fighting in such a queer manner. But I'll fight till I die if ever I'm killed for America's bright starry banner. Now it, it was only John Bull to the fore, then I'll rush into battle quite gaily. With a spully, another up, with a heart and a half, with me elegant sprig of shillelagh. Davish, you thief, if I had you but here, your beautiful plans I'd be ruining. I'd give you a taste of me bayonet, be dad, for trying to bust up the Union. Then the Irish Brigade in battle was seen, their blood in our caution freely. With the bayonet charges they rushed down the foe, with a shout of the land of Shillelagh. Over the dead lay in heaps, Pat Murphy lay bleeding and gory, with the hole in his head from a rifleman shot that finished his passion for glory. No more in the camp shall his laughter be heard, or his voice singing ditties so gaily. Like a hero, he died for the land of the free, far away from the land of Shillelagh. Then surely Columbia can never forget all well, the valor and fail whole communion. How nobly the brave Irish volunteers fought in defense of the flag of the Union. And if ever old Ireland for freedom shall strike with the helping hand of her quite caring. And the stars and the stripes shall be seen alongside the flag of the sweet land of Erin. From the moment you arrive at Middleton, the size of this place is certainly impressive. 
You might be a little confused when you see the Jameson Heritage Centre posted above the main door. But at least by now you'll realise that any mention of this esteemed gentleman is an absolute assurance of the finest quality. However, despite looking the part of a perfect ancient Irish distillery, Old Middleton was not purpose built. It started life in the late 1790s as a woollen mill and was then taken over for use as an army barracks during the Napoleonic Wars. Whiskey didn't start to flow from here until 1825 when the building was purchased by the distilling Murphy Brothers who rapidly prospered. When you spot the huge water wheel you can see just how successful they were as they constructed it almost immediately on arrival. Their original version was wooden but when this iron replacement was constructed in 1852, whiskey making at Middleton was well and truly on the up and up. This is confirmed by the most attractive sheaves of barley that were actually cast onto the wheels out the rim as a permanent reminder of the growth in Irish whiskey's popularity. Even if you consider that by now you have a fair understanding of Irish whiskey making, it's well worth taking the Middleton tour if only to see the sheer scale of operation here. One of the most impressive sights is the grain store, all six floors of it, dating back to 1830. Although just for display purposes today, you do get the real sense of the back-breaking effort that went into whiskey production in the 19th century. The building itself was also under considerable strain as each level invariably held about 200 tonnes of grain. Which is why, if you look very carefully, you'll see a fine set of flying buttresses providing some much needed support. Size, it appears here, was everything. And despite the grand proportions of the mash tonne and washbacks, not to mention the engine power to keep the process running, You'll nevertheless get a shock when you arrive at the pot stills. Gleaming bright, the copper wash still capable of handling up to 31,648 gallons is simply enormous and to this day is famous for being the largest of its type in the whole world. It's well over a quarter of a century since this still was operational but it has been maintained in immaculate condition. One of the best stories told at Middleton concerns a still that you definitely won't be seeing. Sandy Ross, an experienced distiller, was supervising events, quietly going about his duties, when a sudden explosion ripped through one of the stills. Mr. Ross found himself unceremoniously blown through the window and out into the courtyard. And as it was still a time when colours were detachable from a gentleman's shirt, the poor fellow found himself left wearing nothing but his collar and boots. A crowd of startled onlookers soon gathered around, but his blushes were spared when a generous management gave him the afternoon off to get over his traumatic experience. Miraculously, he only sustained a few minor cuts and bruises and was considered a very fortunate chap in the circumstances. There's much more to look at here than just the whiskey making activities of Middleton in its heyday because the beautifully landscaped grounds are magnificent. Don't miss the superb collection of vintage vehicles all in authentic livery scattered around the site. Especially the wonderful Middleton fire engine that takes pride of place in its own exhibition. So where, you might ask, after seeing this fine display of Middleton's past history, are all the many Irish distillers group whiskey brands being produced? Well, as you'll remember from earlier, a new Middleton distillery was built in 1974, and not being the most picturesque of constructions, it's well hidden from visitors view. But whatever is lacking by way of aesthetic architecture, 
is well and truly made up for in speed and efficiency. Few people are fortunate enough to see inside this great modern distillery, but today we've been given kind permission to take a closer look. Size is evidently as much a Middleton watchword as ever, and when you see the enormous still room it literally takes your breath away. Yet despite the bank of computers regulating every part of the process, the pot stills look exactly like the more ancient ones just viewed in the Middleton exhibition. The truth is that although modern technology has brought things on at a fair pace, the old traditions are as revered as ever. And the master distiller here, Barry Crockett, is a living example of how old and new can go together hand in hand. Inspecting a huge warehouse is all in a day's work for Barry, who was actually born on the Middleton site. The cottage that you see, facing the regularly turning water wheel, was where his father, the then master distiller, and his family lived. It is quite remarkable that a highly skilled master distiller embracing all the sophisticated techniques of modern whiskey making can quietly step outside this distillery and visit the place of his birth, where even the first breath of life would have been steeped in the whiskey distiller's art. Not that we're not setting up a few new traditions of our own in this program, because as we leave the sights, sounds and smells of whiskey making behind us, where else could we go to now except the bar? There are some superb examples to be tasted here, not least the Middleton Very Rare, with Barry Crockett's own signature guaranteeing the pedigree of this exceptional whisky. This is a limited edition that has been bottled annually since 1984. As Ireland's most exclusive whisky, you'd be right to expect something a bit special, and you'll not be disappointed. The nose is finely scented, and the first flavours to come through when you taste are almonds, luscious fruit, honey and herbal spice. There is a wonderful finish which is rich and velvety and seems to go on forever. Now on some of the older lorries that you'll have seen in the grounds of Middleton, the name of Paddy Flaherty is well in evidence and you couldn't come to this part of Ireland without trying the great whisky that bears his name. Originating in Cork, the given name for this favourite Irish tipple was Cork Distilleries Company Old Whisky, which was, as you can imagine, more than a mouthful to ask for at the bar, particularly by the third or fourth measure. Consequently, Paddy became the accepted name for this brand after about 1910. Paddy Flaherty was one of Cork Distillery's finest salesmen of the time, flamboyantly making his mark wherever he went. And before too long, folk would just ask for a glass of Paddy's whiskey, and everyone knew exactly what was meant. You'll find Paddy Old Irish whiskey well represented today, and although by no means a heavyweight, it's a light, fresh drink that's as popular as ever. Having now completed the Irish Distillers Group Whiskey Trail, it might appear as if there's little or no room in the modern marketplace for the small independent distillers who once characterised this great industry. But things are not always what they seem. OK, so you'll perhaps have to travel a little up the beaten track, but it's well worth the effort. Because at a little village called Kilbegan in County Westmeath, almost slap bang in the middle of Ireland, you'll find a very different story is told. And even more importantly, you'll get a taste of a whole new generation of traditional Irish whiskies that not so long ago were in danger of evaporating forever into the mists of time. <laughs> Three or 
old jeep skip to our hall door They came brave and boldly yo And the one sang high and the other sang low And the ladies on the rack are like a gypsy yo Well, she slipped up a dress of finest silk A part of the hose of a leather row The rack attack attacks around the door Then she's up with the rack attack a gypsy yo Well, it was late last night that the Lord came home Inquiring for his lady yo All the girls said, I never single hand She's gone with the rack attack a gypsy band Settle for me, my milk white steed From my big horses and that speedy yo I go and find the newly wedded bride Who was run for the rack-a-tack gypsy yo Oh well he rode high, he rode low He rode soft and not also Till he came to the wide open field And spied that lovely lady yo Leave your home and your land And why did you leave your money, yo? Why did you leave the newly wedded lord To be up with the rack attack a gypsy, yo? She said, the what care I for the home and the land And the what care I for the money, yo? What care I for me newly wedded lord When I'd rather have the rack attack a gypsy, yo? Now, last night you slept in your goose for the bed The sheets turned down so bravely, yo Tonight you'll be in the cold open field In the arms of the rack attack a gypsy, yo She said the what care I for my goose for the bed But me sheets turned down so bravely, yo Tonight I'll be in the cold open field In the arms of the rack attack a gypsy, yo You rode high when I rode low You rode south when I rode north I'd rather have the kiss on my yellow gypsy's lips And a mess, my rag I'll take a gypsy Oh, here we go! La 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 Lux Distillery dominates the Kilbegan High Street. And these days, that's a very good thing, because it's a perfect example of a beautifully restored building that is very much a part of Ireland's precious whisky heritage. But things haven't always been quite so satisfactory here, because believe it or not, up until quite recently, Lux was derelict and daily falling into further disrepair. Like so many of the smaller Irish distilleries, whisky production ceased to be viable from the late 1940s onwards, with a whole host of problems resulting in eventual closure in 1957. Through the 1960s, this fine establishment was actually used as a piggery, with the pleasing malty smells of the distillation process superseded by a far less appetizing aroma. However, Despite the fact that the building changed hands on a number of occasions, the property steadily deteriorated until it was fit for nothing. For the people of Kilbegan, the prominent position of such an ugly blot on their otherwise picturesque landscape was a much debated issue, and a plan of action was drawn up. The whole village got together, and as volunteers, took on the task of restoration. Today, the results of this heroic communal venture certainly speak for themselves. It's a remarkable achievement, yet was nothing new for a Kilbegan folk, as their equally public-spirited Victorian ancestors had stepped in once before to save locks from disaster. The distillery at Kilbegan actually dates back to 1757, and like Bushmills, it too claims to be the oldest distillery in the world. Undoubtedly, Bushmills, with its 1608 pedigree, 
is the most aged, but official records do not exist until 1784, some years later than Kilbegan's legal beginnings. But all wrangles aside, no matter how good-natured the gentleman who actually gave his name to the distillery, John Locke arrived in 1843 and quickly started to prosper. With ample supplies of local grain, crystal clear water and turf to keep the boilers well and truly stoked, all it took was John Locke's quite considerable managerial skills to put Kilbegan on the map. He was a man some years ahead of his time, who treated his workforce with respect and provided the best he could for their every need. A fair proportion of the Kilbegan population worked at Locks, and many of the properties were distillery houses, rented out to the workers who eventually were assisted in buying them. For those with no land to keep their animals on, an economic necessity in rural Ireland, a cow and calf park were created at the back of the distillery for the grazing of employees' livestock. Locks also provided a generous supply of coal to their workers at the beginning of the winter that could then be paid for in instalments throughout the year. All in all, a position at Locks had many benefits, but you can't help wondering if the management knew about some of the less official tricks of the trade. The water for brewing was heated in these huge vats, and by stripping off and hopping in at just the right moment, the men could get a free bath without too much overheating. Who can say whether or not this added to the finished flavour of the whisky? But there don't seem to have been many complaints. It's been suggested that the resourceful chaps were also rather fond of drinking the fruits of their labour above and beyond the generous two shots a day allowance that they all enjoyed. When the wort from the mash tun has been fermented with yeast, what you get is a rather low alcohol substance akin to beer, ready to be distilled. Now at Lox, this brew, known as pig ale, could be procured by means of a jam jar and a string, which could be dipped into the wash back when the boss wasn't looking. A similar device, a baby's bottle on a string, used to fit snugly through the bung holes of the finished casks in storage, allowing the men to take a nip of whiskey from any barrel that took their fancy. This does raise an interesting question. How much of the angel's share really did evaporate? Was it not rather more likely that a certain proportion of the lost spirit ended up being consumed in a far more earthly fashion? But if John Locke knew what was going on, he turned a blind eye. And by all accounts, this was a lively, happy place to work. His benevolence certainly paid dividends in 1866 when the company's boiler blew up. And without the funds to buy a replacement, it looked as if Locke's would have to shut down. The good folk of Kilbegan came to the rescue. And if you look inside the restaurant here, you'll see for yourself the happy outcome of the story. They raised enough cash to buy a new boiler, which they proudly presented to John Locke, and the occasion is marked by this commemorative plaque. By the way, should you ever find yourself here in person, make sure it's around lunchtime, because you won't find better home-cooked traditional food in the whole of Ireland. Now you'll recall at the beginning of our tour around Locke's, Whiskey tasting was mentioned, and as you look at all the beautifully authentic working displays, you may be wondering how on earth this is going to be possible. The answer, quite literally, is under your nose, as the historic warehouses here at Locks are full of fine whiskey, quietly maturing in the good Kilbegan air. The interesting quirk of fate that makes this possible is the fact that even when Lox was run as a piggery, the then owner, and every successive owner since, kept the distilling license up to date for the princely sum of £5 a year. This meant that when a new distillery group arrived on the scene in 1989, revitalising such lost whisky brands as Lox and Kilbegan, they were able to utilise this great facility. Cooley was formed by a group of like-minded businessmen 
at a time when Irish Distillers Group, under the control of Perno Ricard, held all the aces. Jameson, Powers, Bushmills and Middleton. It was certainly tough going for the new boys, and IDG did all they could to discourage their rivals. They tried a takeover bid, making it clear that they intended to close Cooley down. But the Irish government stepped in under monopoly regulations. This reprieve gave Cooley the time it needed for its first stocks of whiskey to mature. And since then, although things haven't been easy, they've gone from strength to strength. And so where else then, but to the bar, to try out a very different selection of Irish whiskies. First, of course, it has to be Lox Single Malt, with a surprising hint of peat for an Irish whisky. One thing that Cooley sensibly recognised from the outset was the fact that they'd been better off creating something unique rather than going up against the almighty French-backed IDG brands such as Jameson and Bushmills. It's a pleasant, smooth flavour, and for anyone who enjoys the lighter Scottish malts such as Glenfiddich, it will be an immediate hit. The Kilbegan name has also been brought back to life. And if you're only just starting to appreciate the joys of whiskey, then this is a perfect choice. Sweet and remarkably smooth, Kilbegan has a faint hint of grassiness and certainly suits a wide range of tastes. One of the most interesting labels that you'll see on any Irish whiskey bottle belongs to Tyre Connell Single Malt. It commemorates a great victory by the Irish racehorse of the same name, in 1876. And a lot has been gambled by Cooley on this, their trailblazing brand. Tyre Connell won at terrific odds, and undoubtedly Cooley will do the same with this whisky. It's still young and lively, but there's no unexpected kick from this gentle giant. The overall character is sweet, smooth and mellow but the maturity of the dry finish is very pleasing indeed. Again on the peaty theme, look out for the Connemara single malt, which is even smokier in character than the Lox. If you're feeling brave and definitely not driving, try the Connemara cask strength, which is stronger than anything else you'll experience on this tour, but with all of the smoothness that you'd expect from a triple distilled Irish whiskey. If something a little quieter is to your taste, pick the classic Celtic adornment of the Inishowen bottle. It's a real winner. A relative newcomer, launched in 1996, this soft, smooth, gently peaty, easy to drink blend is growing in popularity daily. Another old favorite to be given the coolie kiss of life is the native Dubliner, Miller's Special Reserve. This elegantly packaged whisky is smooth and well balanced, with all the sweetness of ripe fruit, both in aroma and flavour, but with a complementary dryness that makes it a joy to experience. It's no easy task to set up a whisky distillery, and years on in their project, Cooley are now reaping the rewards of patience and resilience. After all, when a man, or woman for that matter, sets out in the whisky business, they need to understand that the product will be at least three years maturing before anyone can even think about recouping a penny of the costs, let alone making a profit. It takes a brave heart, consummate skill, and a big bank balance to make a go of it. And of course, a handy measure of the luck of the Irish will never go amiss. As our whiskey tour comes to an end, there's just one last place that you really must see. There's nothing of great note here for the Irish whiskey drinker at the present moment, 
but there are plans for this place that you wouldn't believe. Derelict it may look, but this old mill is already in redevelopment. Because in time, this will be a new, small, independent Irish whiskey distillery. We started our journey in Dublin at the Bow Street headquarters of Jameson, Ireland's biggest and best-selling whiskey. With all the expertise and marketing skill of the Irish Distillers Group, the future of this most historic brand is forever assured, and rightly so. What a contrast then, to stand and dream in the shadow of this old mill building of new flavours to come, as a whole modern day generation of Irish whisky makers apply their own interpretation to this most ancient of skills. At first glance, it may have appeared as if the bigger companies had long since swallowed up the individual characters that once shaped this diverse industry. But it's not the case. We've looked long and hard here and a fair way off the usual tourist guides to the whisky routes and can assure you that the world of Irish whisky is as rich and varied as it ever was. Ishgaba is still the undisputed water of life, the stuff of dreams, the inspiration that brings out the genius in us all. Well, just for a little while anyway, sat at the bar with a bottle of fine Irish whisky and good company to share it with. Say so here's a toast to finish with. Slancha, your very good health, and one well for the whiskey as well. Let's never forget the past, but always look forward to the future.